Hello, I'm Too Tight Lechuk, and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. We're here in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have some lion couchants growling in envy at some other library down the street attempting to steal its thunder. And like those lion couchants, I too am green with envy for the sake of Shakespeare, or at least for the sake of Shakespeare's narrator in Sonnet 21, who appears to be going through some things. Now, last week in Sonnet 20, the gender-bending Sonnet 20, we, which actually I could go on about for about 10 more videos, but I'll, I'll press on for the sake of everyone. But in the gender-bending Sonnet 20 last week, we saw the narrator talking about the physical and, dare we say, sexual aspects of love. We do dare. We saw him talking about the sexual aspects of love, and Sonnet 20 implies that there's only one huge thing standing in the way of a full consummation of this love between two men. Now, I don't quite know what the problem is because I love a good challenge and I'm not sure what the problem is with Shakespeare's narrator, but in any case, we get to Sonnet 20. I'll get this out of my way so that I can concentrate a little bit better. We come from Sonnet 21, which we know is between two men, and Sonnet 21 begins with the word so. So is it not with me as with that muse. And at first it appears as though this may be a continuation of Sonnet 20 with that word so, but I think not. The so here acts as a conjunction, as in we both have penises, so we can't consummate our love or else we'll be put to death if we're find out, found out. It's not that sort of a so. This so acts more like an adjective that modifies the unstated noun, my love. It's, it is actually stated, but it's stated as it. So is it not with me? As if to say, my love is not the same as the love that that, muse, that other muse expresses that other poet who might sing your praises. So rather than a continuation or a furthering of the argument of Sonnet 20, we get a completely new sonnet with a simple, haha, it's a simple comparison sonnet, and the first word so signifies as much. Now for those who read the sonnets as if it is a continuous story, Sonnet 21 is the first instance of the rival poet, um, and it creates this list of comparisons, which creates a bit of a literary pissing contest, if you ask me. But it's verbally adept and beautifully intricate in its logical turns, and it's essentially saying, I don't make fancy couplements or fancy comparisons the way that other poets do. And to prove that I don't do it, I'm going to show you some couplements, some comparisons that I don't do, and I will compare this and this and this and this just to show you that I don't do it because I would never do that. No way, not me. See, I didn't just compare all these highfalutin things to our love because that's not something I would do. This is sort of the equivalent of that good old Midwestern saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Or like the lounge lizard who sidles up to you and says, if I told you you had a beautiful body, would you hold it against me? That's Sonnet 21 right there. Logically, this sonnet is shaped like an hourglass, much like my figure when I'm not clad in my Chanel outfit. Actually, I thought it was Chanel. It turns out it's Chanel. So I put it on and spritzed a little Chanel number 69 and decided to go with it anyway. But anyway, Sonnet 21 is shaped like an hourglass. It, it's broad at the top, 
it narrows to a fine, fine point in the middle and then spreads out again at the bottom. Let's take a look at it to see what I'm talking about. Sonnet 21. Let me read through it first. 21. So is it not with me as with that muse stirred by a painted beauty to his verse, who heaven itself for ornament doth use, and every fair with his fair doth rehearse, making a couplement of proud compare with sun and moon, with earth and sea's rich gems, with April's firstborn flowers, and all things rare that heaven's air in this huge rondure hems. Oh, let me true in love but truly right and then believe me my love is as fair as any mother's child though not so bright as those gold candles fixed in heaven's air let them say more that like of hearsay well i will not praise that purpose not to sell now let's just go through it on a line by line basis simply to get the sense of what's going on because the the Syntax is a bit convoluted. So is it not with me as with that muse. So we have the introduction of another muse, and the narrator is saying, it's not like that with me. Whatever, whatever that other poet is saying about you and the ways that he or she is saying it, it's not like that with me. That muse is stirred by a painted beauty to his verse. So he's stirred by some you know, tarted up image that he's creating for himself or something that's made much more beautiful than it could ever possibly be. And who heaven itself for ornament doth use. So he's comparing all of the beauties of you to all these highfalutin things in heaven. And every fair with his fair doth rehearse. So he trots out all these beautiful, wonderful images that are truly hyperbolic and and pretend to sing your praises, but in fact, in doing so, actually doesn't capture your true beauty because your simple true beauty doesn't need all those things. And the second quatrain goes on, continuing what that other muse does, making a couplement of proud compare, making couples um, comparing things that are really high flutin with sun and moon with earth and sea's rich gems, with April's firstborn flowers, and all things rare. So rare meaning very uncommon, like, a, like a, a very precious gem, for instance, or something that you would very rarely find on the earth, but something unique and wonderful. He's comparing all of these things to things that are hardly even possible on the earth. That heaven's air in this huge rondure hems, so he's comparing everything in the world from the highest to the smallest. And he's placing those things as if they are the measure of your being. But your being, in my estimation, I'm telling you in the Senate, is much more simple and much more true. And then the third quatrain. Oh, let me, true in love but truly right. Listen, I'm a poet. I'm writing these poems. Believe me. Don't believe that poet over there who's using all these fancy terms. Believe me. My love is as fair as any mother's child. In other words, as any human being who's ever been born. Though not so bright as those gold candles fixed in heaven's air. I don't need to talk about the stars, those gold candles fixed in heaven's air, those gold, those shining bright golden stars that are in the night sky in heaven. And then the couplet, let them say more that like of hearsay well. All these gossips, all these people talking, 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 let them say what they want. I'm not praising you for any other reason than the fact that I love you. This other poet can't be sure of. I will not praise that purpose not to sell. And here, I have to admit the word purpose bound me up in knots for quite a long time, but it is basically that propose not to sell. I'm not going to praise something that I don't intend to sell. So for instance, if I were selling this 
my beautiful little Shakespeare for a hundred million dollars because it's, that's what it's worth to me. Um, I'd praise it to the sky and say, you know, it, its arms moves, its legs moves. It's not like any other Shakespeare doll on the face of the planet. I, you know, it's got magical charms. You take it home, your whole life will get better. You praise it, praise it, praise it because you want to sell it. And you're trying to get top dime for it, so you praise it to the heavens. But that's not what I'm doing. I don't plan on selling my love. My love is here to stay. And I don't need to do all those things because I love you truly. And that's what this sonnet is saying. But the way it's saying it is so interesting because, as I say, the narrator starts out saying, I'm not going to create all these comparisons, and yet he creates all of these comparisons. And he starts out at the very top of the list, heaven itself for ornament. So I'm not going to compare you to heaven itself, which is the most huge unknowable thing in the world, in the universe, heaven itself. I'm not going to compare you to the sun, which is quite far away, and the moon, which is quite a bit nearer to earth, and then with earth itself, and seas, rich gems. So now we get down to the actual earth, and to the sea, and to the gems that are found in the sea, the little pearls that you might find there in a, in a nice little oyster. I'm not going to compare you to even smaller scale to April's firstborn flowers and all things rare and now here is the genius of Shakespeare all things rare things that you you know the most the most rare diamond that there's only one of in the world I'm not going to compare you to even just the tiniest tiniest thing that there's only one of in the world all things rare that heaven's air in this huge round your hems. My goodness. Shakespeare goes from the tiniest, smallest moment, all things rare, that heaven's air in this huge round your, this huge, this world, this huge universe that surrounds us, hems. So to hem something in is to keep it confined, confined into a small space. But this, <laughs> but Think of what kind of a space that might be, that heaven's air in this huge round your hems. It goes from this small space to this the enormous universe all in one line. It's unbelievably beautiful and unbelievably clever. And then he ends with the last quatrain saying, I'm not going to do any of those things. I'm going to talk about you tr truly. I love you truly. And... My love is as fair as any mother's child. Again, a rather specific thing, though not so bright as those gold candles fixed in heaven's air, and we go up into the skies again. And that heaven's air we hear twice, and it's just, it's just this beautiful hourglass of a poem. Let them say more that like of hearsay. Well, I will not praise that purpose not to sell. The, the couplet ends with the actual point, but the three quatrains are just beautifully constructed to create this symmetrical, weird, beautiful sonnet. So, and this is neither a conjunction nor an adjective, but an ejaculation. And who doesn't like a good, strong ejaculation? But, in fact, I admit it's not actually an ejaculation. It's an interjection. And simply because I love a good stupid joke more than most other things. But anyway, so, male or female, what's going on in this sonnet, Sonnet 21? Can we tell the gender of anyone? Well, yes, we can. Because we can tell the gender of the muse, the third person, the person that's being talked about and that isn't in the room at the particular time. So is it not with me as with that muse stirred by a painted beauty to his verse? Who heaven itself for ornament doth use, and every fair with his fair doth rehearse. So the muse is male. And if we follow from sonnet 20, 
or at least if we if we think about a logical conclusion, it seems as though the narrator is also male in this instance. Arrival is a male, and we would think that the naturally the person who's fighting with that rival is also male. But the third person in the menage a trois is not known. There's no evidence of of anything about the gender of the person, the beloved. But if you consider this, if you consider that it follows Sonnet 20, say for instance it's being staged and there are, there's Sonnet 20 and two men are on the stage talking about the, their love and the one huge thing that stands between them. And on, in the background perhaps is a third person and that third person could be a female who steps in in Sonnet 21 and says, okay, I just heard everything that he said to you, but no, don't listen to him. This, I'm your true lover. He's trying to draw you down the wrong path. I'm the one that you need to listen to. You know, that big thing standing in between you is standing in between you, and maybe you should listen to me because I've got some other things that, you know, maybe we can do. That's a possibility for the staging of this kind of a poem. But it does seem that there are two people vying for the attention of one other person, the gender of which is not quite known. It could be a female who's being addressed here as well. If you see other possibilities for this poem, please feel free to let me know in the comments section. And, But just in general, this poem, I do believe, is... A little bit of genius, I M H O, which, which isn't, you know, I used to think that was an expression of someone, I M H O, as if I'm saying that I'm confessing that I am a hoe, which, that's a separate topic altogether. I M H O, in my humble opinion, as the as the kids say these days. So, I'm a hoe. Sonnet 21 is worthy of your attention, as are all the other wonders that are in the world. Go out, pay attention. Until next time, I'm too tight with Chuck. Mm.